everybody. It is my pleasure to uh, announce our speaker today, Magda Zech from University of Queensland in Australia. And Magda will talk about relativistic quantum uh, clocks, operational approach to quantum aspects of time and causality. In general, Magda has been working on uh, the border between quantum mechanics and gravitational theory, doing some uh, exciting research and we'll have a chance to hear a sample of this research today. Magda, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and the ground is yours. Thank you, thank you very much for reaching out. Uh, I'm really glad to um, have this chance to present my work. I will attempt the first daring deed of the of the evening or of the midday and share my screen. So that's, uh, uh, yeah, maybe to ease us into <laughs> in this uh, hot day or at this time of day. Um, so that's the um, uh, so-called great uh, court of my campus. Um, and actually, it's quite unusual uh, for a physics building to be among the nice ones at the university. I think it's first, first time. <laughs> okay, in Vienna, where I did my PhD, we also had a nice building, so I won't complain. Um, so what you see, it's not a physics building, it's, uh, but they are kind of the same. And so I thought, because uh, it might not be very obvious uh, for people why one would uh, study quantum and gravity in Brisbane, Australia, um, I actually wonder why not all of my colleagues are studying quantum and gravity because every building of, of the of this main court of the campus has some kind of relief at the main entrance that represents the discipline. And I admit that it was only after a few years, like after probably two years of being there, I realized that above the entrance to physics buildings, what we have, I don't know if you can see very well, that's photo I took with my mobile phone, not the greatest quality, but you can see uh, the depiction of the um, Leaning Tower of Pisa with some feather and some two blobby blobs falling. And to the right, you see a Schrodinger cat. And so I think that's, um, that's what everybody should be uh, really obliged to work on. And so this research, of course, involves not only people uh, in, in my, my beautiful sandstone building. There are many collaborators um, around the globe uh, and some students also involved in the research. So I thought to start with actually giving a note to all people that uh, in uh, various ways contributed to, to this research uh, before the end, because there is usually no time <laughs> at the end to, um, uh, to thank everyone involved. All right, so here we are reaching the, um, really the beginning. Um, so I'll just, briefly motivate for those uh, who might not be so uh, well familiar with um, topics relating quantum and gravity, why uh, we do what we do and we do it how we do it. Uh, then I will uh, briefly um, and really very in very broad strokes um, introduce the framework that we use to describe uh, the effects that we study. Um, I explain one of the uh, key insights that we've obtained uh, and then I'll try to have a uh, strolled through other insights that arise from this research, and we'll see how uh, how much we can cover. Um, and if time permits, um, I will briefly say how this research can actually sit back into more applied aspects um, that is designing uh, next generation high precision uh, quantum enhanced sensors in clocks. And so everybody's uh, uh, surely familiar um, with uh, the fact that uh, formulating a unified theory of quantum gravity is one of the biggest quests of theoretical physics. So uh, that's uh, been like this for decades and there are many uh, theoretical approaches uh, and many, many people really working to develop uh, mathematics that would describe this regime. But I would like to um, present in, in my perspective quite a striking um, contrast with where the experiments are. And so essentially all experiments that tested some, some gravity effects in a quantum system, so where there was a genuine quantum and gravitational effect, and they all reside in the regime where gravity can be included uh, just as a potential in the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. Uh, and so you'll be well familiar with the, uh, with the gravitational potential and here write it already as a, um, in a homogeneous uh, gravitational um, field approximation. 
so if you have uh, such a, a potential uh, where m is the mass of the particle and g is acceleration and h is uh, the position or height above earth really in this case uh, such a potential will lead to a relative phase that is acquired by a particle if it uh, propagates uh, in superposition at different heights uh, above Earth, so in different uh, through different values of this potential. And this has been measured for the first time in the 70s, uh, such a relative phase in the famous COW experiment, Colella, Overhausen, and Werner. These are the, the experimenters. Uh, and to the right, you see an interferometer that they used um, to achieve this result. And they use neutrons, and this is um, a crystal from which uh, three areas have been removed to obtain these three slabs that served uh, as a beam splitter, then um, middle one to recombine the paths and third one to um, overlap back the amplitudes. And so they, they uh, rot by rotating this interferometer, they could change uh, the relative height at which the neutron beams were moving and they could um, map out this phase. Uh, and similar experiments has been uh, routinely done uh, since then with many systems. This includes also atoms, um, uh, like the experiments of uh, Kasevich. Um, and I would like to highlight that it's been only in 2017 uh, that this homogeneous gravitational potential that I have uh, included in the slide had to be replaced with the potential with uh, corrections. Uh, beyond the homogeneous potential. So that's that's where we are. And maybe very quickly, maybe I'll just put up the entire slide. Uh, the effect of having a potential uh, is not only that we can have some relative phase, but we can also have a quantized states uh, if this potential uh, can um, bind the system. And if we have some, uh, some surface from which a system can be reflected, um, like a a marble slab for neutrons, then we can create a wet shape uh, potential well. Uh, and um, nominally, one should find quantized states of massive particles in such a potential well to be airy functions. And this has been verified experimentally uh, by the group of uh, Valerina Shirevsky first, and then uh, um, in a series of experiments, various uh, effects um, like Rabi oscillations between these um, gravitationally bound states of neutrons were observed by Hartmut Abela in Vienna. And so, of course, um, this is not to say that we do not have theory that would describe gravity in quantum system beyond Newtonian potentials, just where the experiments are. And of course, there is quantum field theory in curved space time that is uh, the most complete uh, or the most fundamental description of, of quantum mechanics in, in uh, curved space time uh, as described by, by GR. Um, and so the question is, why are we not testing effects of this theory? Well, it's not that uh, there is a lack of uh, will, um, but this theory directly applies uh, to high energies, elementary particles, uh, or strong gravitational fields. So the, the, the predictions, the, or maybe let me put like this, the, the exciting predictions that, uh, that differentiate um, between Newtonian or non-Newtonian uh, gravity from this perspective, appear in the regime that is not so easily accessible to, uh, to experiment. And so the motivation uh, with which we approach the problem uh, is, OK, well, let's look at low energies and weak gravitational fields like on Earth and try to look for uh, quantum and, uh, and relativistic gravity effects there. Uh, and well, yeah, this sounds like a challenge, but there is a, uh, there is a way to um, to actually do it. And this is to uh, consider composite systems, uh, in particular, include internal dynamics of those systems. Uh, and I would like you, uh, like now to convince you um, with just a few slides why that's a good approach. Uh, and it will become clear where from the stress on, on time comes uh, in the title of my talk. And so we are um, going, maybe I'll again put, uh, the full slide. And so what we want to achieve is an effective description uh, of um, first quantized particle that has some internal dynamics uh, and in curved, uh, well, static uh, space time. So really, we are attempting to describe some post-Newtonian metric like we can observe around Earth and not even really uh, being directly interested at first in, in, in some effects due to rotation. And so one can start with composite quantum field theory in curved space time and after the usual uh, 
steps uh, for those familiar they would uh, they would know how it looks but it's not really essential that that we go through it we can obtain a one particle schrodinger equation uh, with the relativistic dispersion relation uh, where the the composition of the field uh, can enter the uh, the fact that we end up with a system that doesn't have just uh, rest mass um, as a parameter uh, but just the rest mass energy uh, and I, that's why i will be putting hats on ends just to really highlight that it's a system who uh, which in its uh, rest frame has some internal dynamics and we are very familiar with such systems if i take an atom and I'm in the rest frame of the atom, there are all the electronic energy levels. It's uh, the, the system has a quantized Hamiltonian in the rest frame. Uh, and I would like to um, give a note to works by Daniel Greenberger, who, who pioneered the approach of having dynamical mass uh, in, in classical physics. Uh, and some of the um, aspects of the formalism are uh, actually quite related. And so now where the clocks are coming, so if you look at this Hamiltonian, uh, we see it describes some quantized rest energy of the particle. And uh, if we um, consider the Lagrangian that corresponds uh, to it, we'll uh, find, again, a, um, an expression that is, I guess, familiar for, for many, where uh, we have uh, the usual Lagrangian over relativistic particle that is proportional to the proper time differential. Um, and again, now, instead of the factor, which usually will be mc square or minus mc square, we have some uh, rest frame Lagrangian. It uh, just represents a Lagrangian that corresponds to, to this quantized mass energy. So in that sense, we see how the, how the proper time can appear here. Um, however, in quantum mechanics, especially when thinking of you know, using things like, uh, systems like atoms as our model system, we would like to talk both about the time dilation in those systems and redshifts of their internal energies. Uh, and from this perspective, it looks like we don't really have a good approach because uh, proper time lives in configuration space and, and energy lives well in phase space. But there is a, a possibility to use a mixed um, uh, framework, um, a Ruthian. Uh, which is simply a partial Lagrange transform between the two. So one can uh, retain the description of internal energy in terms of Hamiltonian, and especially if we just look at a few levels, it's very convenient. We can have some two-level internal Hamiltonian, uh, and the proper time can be included in the formalism um, via uh, time dilation and, and path integrals if one wants to go full, full on. Um, and so what this shows us is that um, composite uh, quantum particles uh, can be can be seen as clocks. Uh, their evolution is given by proper time along their trajectories, like for classical particles. And the importance here is that both internal degrees of freedom that uh, can keep track of time and the external degrees of freedom on which the the path and therefore the proper time depend are quantized. Uh, so in this sense, uh, we can have um, a dynamical theory that will describe uh, quantum, fully quantum systems, fully in the sense uh, all the relevant degrees of freedom are quantized, and we can ask questions about proper times or redshifts of, uh, of those systems. And so at um, really very, very low energies, um, we can go to something that looks at first sight like uh, fully non-relativistic dynamics. However, I've hidden all the internal energy in this M hat, so let me unpack it a little bit, because uh, I think it's quite instructive. Um, so this, the, uh, the rest mass energy will include some ground state energy, and this can really be associated with the mass parameter of a system and the dynamical part that we usually associate with the Hamiltonian that drives transitions between various uh, internal levels, and the same we see here. Uh, and if we do this, we'll have um, then the fully non-relativistic center of mass uh, dynamics, where a mass just enters as a parameter, and then the, re the remaining terms, which have this one over C squared corrections, um, and they are very easy to interpret. So the first term, uh, okay, they are easy to interpret if I tell you that phi stands for the gravitational potential. <laughs> so phi stands for the gravitational potential, and uh, the first term describes the gravitational time dilation or redshift, and the second term, uh, if you recognize that uh, P squared over 2M um, non-relativistically uh, gives 
uh, velocity, then we recognize the second term as giving the special relativistic time dilation. So what uh, this low energy Hamiltonian shows us is that if we have a system with some internal dynamics that drives transitions at some frequency omega, the first term uh, will give the, the redshift. So if I have in particular some homogeneous gravitational field, I will recover the usual uh, familiar expression for the redshift that is acceleration time height difference over C square. And the second term will give the, the relativistic uh, frequency shift. And so for um, clocks that are localized classically, uh, like atomic clocks in uh, experiments of David Weinlein, uh, these shifts were, um, I would still say recently, unless there are students in the room, recently beautifully demonstrated. Uh, so there were two optical atomic clock setups that uh, were the, the tables on which the atomic clocks were sitting could be shifted up and down. And this allowed to confirm that uh, MO, uh, across atoms sitting at these different tables, there was the expected gravitational time dilation. And the, the traps in this, of these clocks could also be uh, moved by, uh, by appropriately uh, moving the, the traps and that mimicked uh, the motion, relative motion of the clocks. Uh, and so these things were confirmed. And I will stress that this gives us um, uh, confirmation of the of the regime where internal energies uh, need to be described quantum mechanically. We have some some discrete atomic levels, but the uh, motional degrees of freedom were uh, effectively fully um, described classically by a position of a clock or a motion of a clock in some classical uh, path. And so now we can go beyond this. Uh, and so what we've constructed first as a thought experiment. Is Excuse me, may I ask of... something? May I ask a question? Yes. And yes. what's the sensitivity of such an experiment like you've, you've mentioned uh, recently? What uh, high difference can you measure? Can they measure? Oh, so um, nominally, um, if one looks at the precision of the, of the best uh, atomic clocks currently, you could resolve uh, time dilation due to height difference of some two centimeters. Okay, and uh, that would be Kasevich or who? Uh, no, this would be uh, Juni in Nist in Boulder. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Well, I have a more fundamental question. Why do you base your quantum mechanics of particles on the square root Hamiltonian? Dirac showed that this is not correct because it does not reproduce relativistic theory of particles. Yes, yeah, so I, I started with the, with the idea that I, I only need an effective theory that will describe highly composite systems that are not elementary particles themselves, like an atom or a molecule. Um, and so of course, it's, so I'm not presenting a fundamental theory. I want an effective theory that can capture the key degrees of freedom for a highly complex system. So if I would like to model my atom like a rubidium fully from uh, quantum field theory in curved space time nominally, it would be possible, but it would be huge, huge overhead over uh, what I'm interested in looking. Uh, so that's that's the reason. I'm just interested in collective uh, degrees of freedom of the center of mass and just a few internal states that I only need an effective description for. So I can, uh, this restricts me uh, to systems whose uh, size is such, so not the extent of the wave function, but the size is such, uh, it's not large, compared to the scale on which gravitational field varies. And on Earth, this is not really putting any constraint on like the size of the molecule. Uh, and especially a single atom would be, would be well in the regime where uh, I expect this effective theory to apply. But in such a fundamental theory, one should rely on the more fundamental starting point. Like yeah, say, so the, our the starting case point- would be the positronium, which is it. System. Yeah, that's right. So uh, we did look, maybe I'll, I have a time uh, to, to get there. We also looked at um, a system like an electron in curved space time. And then of course we don't, don't start from the square root but from a full <laughs> relativistic description of, uh, um, of Dirac equation with, uh, with gravity included um, via the, the connection and so on. Um, so this is this is uh, applicable. This effective theory uh, that I mentioned, uh, we apply to systems to which that's sufficient. 
and this is not to say that uh, one cannot uh, look at the um, quantum field theory directly in first space time. Just the effects that I describe uh, can be captured with this effective treatment that is very, very expedient and very, yeah, it's very efficient to describe what, uh, what we need. So I hope that uh, justifies at least to some extent, and uh, I guess we can go back to the discussion at the end, uh, if there will be any feel that some of the results could be extended by looking at more fundamental theory. And so what uh, I would like to, uh, to move on to is um, a thought experiment, uh, which uh, presents um, yeah, some idea of what uh, what um, one can probe in this regime and it captures, uh, I think it captures it in an inter interesting way. So um, yeah, I've just mentioned time dilation experiments where one takes uh, a pair of clocks and uh, they follow a word lines in space time along which different proper time elapses. Now with a quantum clock, what one can uh, conceive is a, a quantum version of such a twin paradox uh, with a, a single clock or a single twin. <laughs> Uh, that moves in superposition uh, along, uh, say, two paths, such that along each of them, um, different proper time will elapse. And I get the bottom references where this is uh, elaborated uh, in, in um, various manners. That includes electrons and photons that would be elementary particles uh, that would be captured without the effective theory. And so the question is really what happens. Um, so one can, of course, uh, say, well, if a clock is uh, measuring uh, time in superposition so, uh, and, and there is a different proper time for each branch, then it ends up um, younger and older than itself. Um, but there is a, a quantitative answer to it, which uh, um, allows an experiment to be done. Um, and one can also get um, the intuition very quickly. Maybe I'll go through uh, just a few steps and then we can uh, uh, confirm our intuition in that way. So we have a system whose internal degrees of freedom evolve according to the proper time along the word line. So this internal degree of freedom, uh, so yeah, in particular using this Ruthian uh, form for the dynamics uh, will evolve in a familiar way where we have internal Hamiltonian integrated over, over uh, the time just that these proper times will be different um, along each of the word lines um, in, in this kind of uh, cartoon Max Zender interferometer. And so what happens is essentially that uh, internal degrees of freedom uh, that measure or keep track of, uh, of proper time will entangle to the path. Uh, and so unlike uh, the typical use of interferometers when one looks for a phase shift here, uh, time dilation between the trajectories gives uh, correlations and they result uh, in modulating the visibility of, of the interference pattern. If one overlaps the paths and the measures uh, where the particles are coming out, so this is interference in the path degree of freedom, uh, then this internal uh, degrees of freedom uh, will necessarily correlate to the paths uh, and give some change in the visibility of the interference, so this prefactor. And this really depends on uh, the initial state, uh, the proper time and the dynamics and, and this compact form. So essentially it just compares uh, the two states. And this is of course uh, intuitively uh, as expected uh, because by its very nature, proper time reveals which way information. And we know that uh, there is complementarity between possibility to see interference in a two-way interferometer and our ability to know the path uh, that has been taken. And here the knowledge of the path is stored in the time evolving internal degrees of freedom. So even if we don't measure them, they will, uh, they will cause uh, uh, some change to the visibility. And if there are any experimental uh, physicists in the room or experimentally minded physicists, of course, and they will realize it's very easy to make interference uh, go down in the experiment. Uh, but for a periodic clock, we expect also a revival. Um, and this is simply because if the proper time is equal to a full period of the clock, uh, these uh, states uh, tau one, tau two, that are just any degrees of freedom that, uh, that we use to, to keep track of time, uh, they will become fully indistinguishable. And so we expect the periodic 
loss and revival of the interferometric contrast, uh, depending how proper time compares to the um, period of the internal evolution of the system. And so if we um, look at the simple example where these uh, paths are really idealized, and so we have a particle that sits at um, heights that differ by h for some laboratory time t on Earth. So g will be gravita uh, uh, gravitational acceleration on Earth for the quantitative uh, part of the exercise. Um, then we can uh, uh, expect uh, this kind of interference. So let me walk you through. So we have here the non-relativistic part of the phase, that is um, this phase that has been measured already by Colella Overhausen Werner. Then we have a, um, a semi-classical correction. Uh, and the one way to interpret it is that if I have a system that can uh, um, at all measure time, it means that this internal degree of freedom cannot be eigenstate of the internal Hamiltonian. It has to be some, some superposition of, of uh, internal states. And in particular, for a periodic clock, it would be a superposition of, of some two states. And so the, the total mass energy of the system is not just the ground state energy, but, but the average energy. And that's what gives correction to the phase. Uh, so we essentially see a semi-classical mass energy equivalence uh, in action. And then we have this first uh, term that is the, the crucial one um, from this perspective that gives the modulation and the visibility and it's periodic uh, because we have uh, here a periodic clock and mu is the frequency of the clock. And so we see essentially if I would write the frequency as one over period, we will recover that this term depends on um, essentially the ratio of proper time over the period decorated with a pi or something like this. And so if we take some optically separated energy levels, like would be available in strontium, for example, uh, then this frequency can reach uh, 10 to the 15 hertz. Um, my unit disappeared. And so in order to observe in an experiment, um, a loss and revival of, of the visibility, we would need um, the remaining parameters. So the space time area of the interferometer, interferometer h times t to be 10 meters time a second. And so in such an experiment, what we would see is essentially what is plotted with the blue line on, uh, on, this, uh, on the plot that I've displayed. Uh, so in Newtonian physics, uh, no matter whether you've implemented some time evolving degree of freedom in, in your system or you took an eigenstate of the internal Hamiltonian, the, the, uh, the evolution of this degree of freedom will be the same uh, irrespective of the path and you will just see the black dashed line. In GR, uh, so if time dilation applies to this regime, like it's not obviously a relief for GR, but if we have this relativistic correction, um, we will have this slight phase shift and also um, the contrast of the interference will, uh, will change. And so the, the thick uh, red line is just tracks the, the visibility itself and the full interference pattern is given in blue. And so can we do it? Obviously, uh, I guess um, it will be clear that it's challenging. So just to, to highlight some uh, randomly chosen not fully randomly, but independently chosen record. So in the group of Mark Kasevich in Stanford, um, they have, um, I would say, well-documented um, superposition size of some 30 centimeters between, um, I think this was all cesium atoms in, in their case. Um, and in, a different type of interferometer, so that's important, a different type of interferometer in the group of uh, Holger Muller in Berkeley. Uh, they could hold atoms in a coherent spatial superposition for some 20 seconds. And so from our perspective, ideally one would combine the two. Uh, that it's not impossible, in fact, there are thoughts in that direction. Um, and there is, in fact, uh, uh, quite some effort going to uh, to realize such a thought experiment as I presented with a uh, at, with typically an atom whose uh, superposition of internal uh, electronic levels one would use to encode this timekeeping. Um, and so, in uh, uh, in Leibniz uh, at the university, 
and the sorry in Hanover. <laughs> It gets, uh, it's already past nine, so uh, please excuse me. The Leibniz University in um, Hanover, they are building um, a long baseline interferometer uh, where one of the main goals uh, of, uh, of this interferometer will be to realize uh, this um, type experiment. Uh, there are also ideas to look at the special relativistic version of this, uh, of this effect. Of course, special relativistic time dilation would lead to the same uh, effect if I have two amplitudes that move uh, with relative speeds. Um, and, uh, the idea is to use um, just a single electron in a panning trap um, as such a quantum twin. One can also extend all these to photons or apply all these to photons. Um, and so there is one of the NASA missions and they are interested in, uh, in implementing this in space. Uh, and there are groups uh, in Vienna and Padova that are uh, considering various uh, so iterations of the of the uh, photon inversion, and so far what has been done and there was an analog experiment where instead of time dilation affecting a spin, um, I believe of rubidium atoms, um, there was an inhomogeneous magnetic field that simply would give a different rate of precession uh, along uh, two arms um, of a uh, of an interferometer. And this was to illustrate the main premise, the main idea. And of course, it has been observed uh, that if this magnetic field corresponds to time dilation that would give a half a clock period difference between the arms, then it washes away interference completely. And if it's a full period, the interference comes back. So this has been realized by the group of Ron Foman um, in, a, in this very beautiful experiment. Um, and there's also a nice accompanying uh, perspective to their work. Uh, so here just uh, the two references. All right, so this completes the part where I wanted to highlight um, one of the uh, ideas one can try to test uh, that comes from, from this approach. Uh, so maybe now I will ask uh, our chairman how much time uh, is there left for the seminar? Um, well, I would say uh, 20 five minutes we can give you. Okay, but this would, I guess, include questions. Okay, I guess if I finish earlier, nobody will complain. Nobody <laughs> so, okay. will complain, of course, of course. All right. Uh, all right, so I thought to give uh, then some overview of uh, other questions that one can address uh, with this approach. Uh, because it's of course not just testing, um, a proper time uh, effects on quantum systems, one can do uh, something else. And so one of the uh, questions that uh, we did address uh, was, um, what does it mean uh, to test equivalence principle in quantum mechanics and when it can differ uh, from testing its validity in classical theory? And there are still various opinions in, in the literature um, and they come really from different ways that people would uh, would think about the um, Einstein equivalence principle. So if one thinks of the Einstein equivalence principle as saying that uh, uh, the trajectory of a particle is independent uh, on its mass, uh, then quantum mechanics, well, we don't really have trajectories. Uh, so people will argue that, well, it doesn't even apply or that it's uh, explicitly violated. Uh, then other people thinking in terms of path integral formulation of quantum mechanics will say, well, it's all about testing whether dynamics has the expected form of being um, producing to um, Lorentz theory locally and where gravity is uh, included via minimal coupling. Uh, and then the path integral formulation, you really just um, can think of it as a classical dynamic. So it's by con construction. <laughs> testing whether these dynamics has the right form that includes gravity in the right way is, is by construction equivalent. Um, but I would, uh, I would argue that um, this uh, view can only be really applied to really fundamentally elementary particles that are really uh, with no internal structure. And as soon as we have some internal structure that, um, and this is really how all the experiments are done, then that, then, um, that uh, what it means to test equivalence principle does actually differ. And one way to realize it is to uh, look back at our uh, low energy Hamiltonian and recall that one way to understand 
testing Einstein equivalence principle at, at lowest uh, energies is really to test um, the equivalence of the various formulation of the mass or mass energy. Um, I guess everybody will be familiar with we a testing weak equivalence principle, which is one aspect of the equivalence principle, uh, where we um, drop uh, different masses and see in this way uh, whether they fall with the same acceleration. And this tells us something uh, about whether the inertial and gravitational mass is the same. Now, if you ask, is the gravitational redshift universal for clocks governed by uh, different types of interactions, then you are actually testing whether you can factor out the internal uh, mass energy from the rest and the gravitational mass energy terms to just get the redshift factor. Um, so you are testing equivalence of rest and a gravitational uh, masses. And if you test universality of, of the special relativistic time dilation with clocks, uh, you are testing whether the rest mass energy and the inertial mass energy are equivalent and whether you can pull out uh, the special relativistic redshift factor. And from this perspective, uh, I think it's immediately clear that if, if we talk about some composite systems, but classical, like some classical system with n internal levels, uh, then simple um, counting of the parameters tells us that it's much less than we need to test uh, for a system that is quantum and has n internal levels, because then we have to compare or test equivalence of uh, Hermitian operators. Um, and so here you have some numbers for fully testing the equivalence of, of three mass operate mass energy operators and that they are either constrained to be classical in a sense just uh, testing their eigenvalues uh, or we stay agnostic uh, in quantum mechanics and assume that they can be just different as operators and then there are many more parameters to test so from the perspective of how we actually uh, test equivalence principle and this is always with at least atoms uh, well of course there are photonic tests as well but many of those tests are with composite quantum systems then there are many more ways in which equivalence principle uh, could nominally be violated than in classical theory. Um, and so the two rel uh, reduce to one another uh, if we additionally assume that these internal mass energies in any theory that is post uh, general relativistic that violates equivalence principle somehow are constrained to necessarily commute. And so this leads to a need for testing more parameters and, and in different experiments. Uh, then another uh, insight, and here I will be quite brief. I'll not go into details, but I hope uh, some of you could be interested. Uh, so with this formalism, we, we, we can describe a quantum system that sits somewhere in space time relative to a massive body. And we know that only relative degrees of freedom in physics matter. And I can write the dynamics in the way that I explicitly include the relative positions of the clocks and the source masses for the gravitational field uh, to obtain a description of uh, these clock particles uh, in a space time where I put the source mass uh, into a quantum state that is in superposition of two uh, semi-classically localized state. So this trick only applies as long as I consider superpositions of uh, classical uh, gravitational fields, so akin to, to um, semi-classical states of electromagnetic field. Uh, and in this way, uh, one can um, ask the question, so what happens uh, to causal relations between events operationally defined by clocks in space when I consider the source masses uh, to be in these quantum superpositions. And this allows uh, to get a quantitative answer. And we formulated um, a theorem that is um, similar in spirit to Bell theorem, but applies to temporal order between time-like events. And one can uh, arrange a scenario where using um, a gravitational field from, from a massive body, one can entangle time order of time-like events um, across across clocks uh, and violate a theorem that would uh, um, grant that events are always described, the order of events is always locally classical. So in a, in a, in a nutshell, uh, this effective formalism can also be used as a toy model for some quantum, for constructing quantum and, and gravitational causal structures and exploring 
uh, what kind of causal relations are possible to to achieve uh, with the constraint that um, it can only be used uh, for this kind of semi-classical uh, states of geometry. So uh, it doesn't tell us anything about the quantization of dynamical degrees of freedom of GR. Well, of course, it is interesting whether fundamental degrees of freedom of GR are quantized. And uh, some of you might be aware there is a big interest lately in the question whether gravity can mediate entanglement. And there are experiments dedicated uh, to observe such an effect. And this really uh, comes from um, works by uh, Gerard Milburn here from uh, the University of Queensland and Vir Kafri and Jake Tyler, um, who are interested in uh, what, what uh, would be an empirical consequence if gravity was classical. And since they were um, quantum information scientists, uh, they ask, okay, what, what do we actually mean by saying that gravity is classical? So they said, okay, uh, some interaction um, is locally classical if it cannot mediate entanglement, if it can be described as an LOCC channel, so local operations and classical communication. And they say, okay, what do we mean by gravity? And they consider, okay, the unitary part of such a channel must reproduce Newtonian potential. So this, this is about the non-relativistic uh, gravity and what would we, what would it mean that it cannot uh, uh, it cannot uh, be quantum? It's, it's fundamentally classical. And so they shown um, in a series of works that start with these two references that I just gave that um, there is a, a general consequence of such an assumption that gravity acts as an LOCC channel and reproduce Newtonian uh, potential. And this consequence is that apart from not producing entanglement, it also actually um, has some decoherence. So if I have uh, some superposition of relative distances of uh, between a pair of gravitationally interacting systems, there will be decoherence. Uh, and this decoherence rate depends uh, on the gradient of the Newtonian interaction. And it's quite intuitive because if you want to reproduce homogeneous Newtonian potential, you don't need to know anything about the position of a test mass in the field. It just has to move with a fixed acceleration. While if you want to reproduce something beyond, you need to know where your test mass is. So you need to perform some sort of measurement. And if your theory is, um, if this measurement is mediated by degrees of freedom that are fundamentally uh, classical, it must lead to some decoherence. So this is just a, a hand-waving argument and one can, one can uh, prove that that's the case, but I hope it gives some intuition. So this decoherence rate depends on the masses of the gravitationally interacting bodies, the size of the superposition of their relative distances. Um, and this applies to some small um, relative distance as compared to, um, say, average distance between them. So uh, they, they looked in this regime. So D here is kind of like a distance from the center of mass to the surface, and then delta x would be uh, different possible uh, locations of some of some quantum particle. And that's actually what uh, what we did with this theory. So uh, a direct way to verify whether gravity can um, or not mediate entanglement would be to make an experiment and test whether or not it can, but it's very difficult. And so we thought, okay, what current experiment experiments can tell us uh, about this possibility based on this um, decoherence that is predicted uh, by this um, non-entangling uh, Newtonian limit of the theory. So we looked at experiments pardon, where one of the masses I, was Earth. Yeah. Pardon, if I may yes, ask yes. one question, what is the source of this, in, uh, of this decoherence? Uh, um, so how, how does it happen? You are trying to construct a theory um, that, so this this based on the fact that there are some dynamical degrees of freedom of gravity. So there is no direct interaction at the distance. There is a third system that is supposed to be gravity. It, and it's constrained to be um, an, a local uh, classical channel. And so you are trying to play a game in which you want to reproduce the Newtonian term in an effective interaction between two bodies by using the fact that they interact with the third system. So each of them only interacts with these 
destroy gravitational degrees of freedom. But, and they are supposed to mediate but, entanglement. Uh, but the degrees of freedom uh, of gravity field are purely classical here in this model, right? Yes, exactly. So that's 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 the construction. So, yes. and so, so, one can, so this decoherence yes. is some sort of like an efficient uh, efficient trick, probably no, because for for proper quantum decoherence, we need some correlation between quantum degrees of freedom and then forgetting degrees of freedom. Uh, yeah, well, in this case, it's supposed to be fundamentally classical. So the way you do it, of course, you, you construct everything quantumly, but then uh, you just constrain things to, to one basis. So that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's okay. the way okay. it's formally okay. constructed. Yeah. Okay, so it's not it. one of got those, it. I see now your question. Yeah, it's not one of those hybrid theories. You just, you just built um, really an open quantum system where you have pair of masses and the third system, the interaction between pair of masses is fully mediated by a third system. And then you may make a constraint. This third system's system is constrained to only one provide basis. an LOCC channel. And, one, basis. And and that's, uh, one basis and that's it. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So it behaves, yeah, exactly. uh, it is sort of like quantum, but if you constrain yeah, to one basis, it's, it's, it behaves can... classically. Yeah, yeah, okay. you can construct it as a collisional model with with the right constraint. One can also show independently that if you if you have a certain unitary term uh, in the dynamics, that in order not because if you have some um, sorry some potential some potential term in the dynamics, nominally you can always use it to entangle stuff. And so you can show that there is a minimal amount of decoherence that is needed to be added to such a theory so that entanglement can never even in principle develop. So what they did is a direct construction of a channel, but then later on uh, when, um, the, 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 uh, there was a realization that there is a very generic um, argument for this minimum decoherence that just comes from uh, the requirement uh, that you want to reproduce um, at some scale the, the Newtonian potential. I mean, that's reasonable. Uh, mm -hmm requirement but but yeah the construction it's uh yeah it's it's uh, it's quantum with uh with this um constraint okay thank you yeah no worries. so i'll just maybe put up the results because i think they are quite uh amusing and quite striking and essentially what turns out is that um if one looks at coherence that has already been observed in matter wave experiments then it seems that at least this version of a channel that is just to reproduce the Newtonian term, maybe if one goes beyond and makes a more elaborate requirement, it seems that this is already off the table by um, a few to a 50 orders of magnitude. Maybe I will put a disclaimer. So this very high number of orders of magnitude comes from uh, using results from this top reference. Um, this is from the group of Mark Kasevich. And there are some I would say very reasonable doubts whether this experiment actually achieved quantum coherence. But even if we exclude results of that, um, of that experiment, uh, so just looking at the stars, um, um, the, the, the dots in the shape of the stars, uh, then the bound on possible coherence that could be observed with the atom interfering in the Max Zender type experiment on Earth, uh, it would already be uh, be limited. What one is can, LMT? One can uh, elaborate. Pardon? Magda, what is Sorry, LMT? Yeah, this LM yes, yes, I was trying to, to sweep some details under the carpet. So yeah, on the horizontal axis, it um, essentially corresponds to the size of the superposition. And this LMT is how many photon momentum transfers were um, applied to, say, the upper path uh, of your um, atom interferometer. So you are using photons to make a beam splitter for atoms by coherently transferring uh, photon momenta only to one branch of the superposition. And the more photons you use, uh, the more initial velocity difference you get. And therefore, after some propagation time, the, the larger spatial superposition you have. And so in that way, this LMT order that says how many photons you are transferring corresponds to the spatial superposition size delta x. Or can be translated to, in a sense, or calculated. You can recalculate from that. 
and on the vertical axis there is the visibility um, of the interference pattern that was obtained. In not all experiments, one does get a good, um, a clear statement of the visibility. That's why the sources are often quite limited, because uh, uh, not all groups would report an actual number. Not all experimental groups would report the actual number. And I think it's quite intuitive um, also why um, in the particular regime of, uh, of these interferometers this happened. So, um, I mean, the authors of the original study were shocked where we have uh, came up with this um, because they said, we looked at all the experiments that were available and they were really off. And this was true in 2015 and 14 but it's not true anymore, or it wasn't true anymore in 2018. And it all matches the intuition. So as I said, um, this decoherence really depends on the gravity gradient. You are not supposed to see any decoherence as long as your matter wave is superposed over region of the field where you can approximate gravity to be homogeneous. And indeed experiments in 2012 where they published the papers were all in the regime where the matter waves would only see the homogeneous potential, but they moved since then. And exactly the regime where they are sensitive to the gravity gradient is the regime where uh, this discrepancy between the prediction and the experiment uh, starts to quickly uh, open. Probably the size, like for big superpositions, the size we should, we should maybe uh, do a more precise calculation, but the uh, the, main, the main message is experiments with a large uh, superpositions for atoms can really test these kind of theories because in, they are in the regime where the right conditions for these theories to make a big difference uh, with standard theory are, so where there is some gravity gradient appearing. And so I think that's quite an interesting insight that one can uh, gain from, from this kind of uh, simple interferometric tests with uh, with composite particles. Uh, yeah, I guess if we have a few more minutes, and this will be really just uh, two slides, um, if there is anyone that happens to have interest, whether this kind of research uh, can be of any relevance uh, for uh, more applied questions. And so one of the uh, applied uh, research that happens with composite particles that are used as clocks are, of course, atomic clocks. Uh, and there, the goal is uh, to use the internal energy levels that would be well, uh, uh, say, separate from the center of mass so that they remain coherent uh, and use them as a frequency reference. Um, however, as I argued, um, these uh, time dil dilation corrections that arise really as the lowest, lowest order relativistic effects uh, for composite particles, they are equivalent to having quantized mass energy. Uh, and I guess many of you would have the, uh, immediately the intuition that if you start to think of some harmonically trapped particle, uh, then the, the states of the trap depend on the mass. If I have a fixed frequency or free, a, a fixed uh, trap stiffness that is independent of the mass of the particle, then the states depend on the mass, which means that the eigenstates of a particle with uh, internal mass energy in a harmonic trap are, uh, maybe I'll put my second slide, are correlated center of mass and internal states. Um, of course, there will be also a shift in the gravitational potential, the usual one for, for, for different masses uh, kept fixed by, by fixed potential. So this essentially means that there are these uh, additional correlations and uh, additional frequency shifts um, that uh, with clocks like those of Juni, they actually want to go exactly to 10 to minus 22 fractional frequency shift in their next generation clocks. This would be exactly the regime where these kind of minute effects that come from the fact that your atomic, your atom, whether it's in the ground or excited state, it has slightly different mass. Uh, these correlations and these additional shifts will start to be uh, important. And another uh, aspect of this is actually very uh, simple to, to understand. Um, and this will be relevant for, um, well, applications in other fundamental research. And that is 
experiments, um, say molecule experiments that try to measure um, large superpositions for, uh, for this kind of highly composite systems. So one would like to keep coherence of the entire uh, particle uh, and usually um, as a go-to state for semi-classically propagating quantum particle will take a Gaussian state. And then there are some internal degrees of freedom that can be tensored with it. But such a system, if we include these uh, uh, mass energy equivalence corrections, actually we immediately see that there is a problem because if I have a system with the quantized mass energy and uh, some fixed uh, momentum due to Gaussian distribution picked at some particular value, then the velocity, so the configuration space, the velocity will be um, different for the different mass energy components. And so this is a very small effect, but if I have many, many um, uh, internal states that can contribute to this, to, to this differential propagation, it can become, uh, and if I, I would like to keep those systems propagating for a longer time, this uh, becomes substantial. So if one looks as a figure of merit for a coherent length of a molecule, uh, then for typical parameters that, uh, maybe I'll give a reference already the bottom, for typical parameters, how these molecules are prepared in the experiments by Marcus Arndt at least, these effects would uh, limit the, the longitudinal coherence to, um, uh, so the, this is the localization that is because of the different possible uh, propagation velocities would reach the coherence length in 20 milliseconds and the size of the molecule in three minutes. So the system would stop to be semi-classically localized. And so here uh, there was really a neat question that is what is the semi-classical uh, uh, state um, for such a, a composite particle where you include these low energy um, relativistic corrections that are tantamount to mass energy equivalent of quantized mass energy. And so for this, of course, one has to have the right uncertainty and we formulated the uncertainty in position and velocity and we found uh, the right uh, class of states. And I think apart from the, the inherent interest in, in a neat uh, maybe mathematics there, uh, they might be of interest for experiments where one would really like to keep coherence of a system um, whose internal degrees of freedom cannot be frozen out uh, and then uh, they might become relevant. And so with this, uh, I'll finish. Uh, I'll just put up all my conclusions uh, uh, up there. Uh, maybe I'll just highlight uh, that I try to um, present how looking at composite particles at low energies can allow us to test uh, some genuine interplay between quantum mechanics and relativistic, at least non-Newtonian gravity, and it gives insights into additional foundational questions that relate to the quantum nature of gravitational degrees of freedom or equivalence principle in quantum mechanics. And there could be possible applications to other areas uh, of quantum research as well. And so, yeah, with this, I really thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any uh, remaining questions. Well, thank you very much, Magda, for, um, for the exciting uh, talk uh, covering uh, quite a lot of areas of a, uh, uh, recent research on the gravity quantum edge. Uh, well, I guess we have uh, time for, for some questions, so is there anyone? May I ask a question? Uh, Taihun, yes, please. Uh, actually, I I will actually personally actually I have some puzzle to assign the clock in the system because in the uh, in uh, classical physics we uh, just simply assign the time on the system by just putting the clock. But when we actually think about actually clock itself, uh, it should be a, it should be some composite actually system uh, which has an internal uh, dynamics. Otherwise, what's the meaning of actually clock in the elementary particle, for example, electron on the uh, uh, attached uh, to the clock, because uh, if we don't have any internal actually dynamics, uh, we cannot actually make any clock. So, so that's yeah, my. That is that is 
Yeah, that's very true. That's why I've been all the time stressing that the particles are, are composite and their internal degrees of freedom are used uh, to measure uh, to measure time. And that's, that's very important, uh, for example, from the perspective of, I think I de-shared my screen, is that? Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, is you that did. right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right, okay, Magda. Uh, awesome. At least, uh, at least I know again. what I... Yeah. Uh, but right. if for compact yeah. part, uh, so yeah, so here you see uh, exactly what the uh, what I guess you are anticipating that if we don't have a clock, uh, we would have a different result of the experiment um, to the situation where there is some physical degree of freedom that keeps track of time. And so, in this plot, if I used some really elementary particle, even if there is gravitational time dilation, I obtain the same curve as in Newtonian physics, so this black dashed line. But if I have a system whose two orthogonal internal levels are put in superposition and therefore they change physical state with time and in that sense can be seen as a clock, I have a different outcome of the experiment. So there is uh, ambiguity in this assigning the clock in the system? No, or... so precisely the opposite. So there is an unambiguous way to define what does it mean for a particle to be treated as a clock. Uh, and so elementary, So for elementary particle, you can only use its position um, as sort of arrival time <laughs> um, type clock or a position of a photon uh, in some fiber, you can try to make a clock out of that. Uh, but I've been talking about particles whose internal states in the same sense as when I have a wristwatch, I can tell you where it is, but it doesn't tell you what time it shows. You have to look at its internal state, which is the handles. And for us here, uh, the clock is say an atom, but the handles are internal states of the atom. Magda, so I like to, to, to summarize, to look for, uh, at your research from like a broader perspective. As far as I understand, the novelty here is uh, compared to the previous, um, uh, previous studies of uh, quantum effects and, and gravity or in gravity is that you consider composite systems, right? This, uh, this has not, at least to my memory, this has not really been done before this like 2010 or 10 ish or, or, or when you when you guys kick, yeah. kicked in and uh, so as far as i understand that this gives you a lot uh, a whole this opened like a whole lot of a uh, bunch of uh, of new effects like for example the cohering effect if you just look at the center yes. of mass without looking yes at including the... also your your insights with the broadcasting uh, ah, yeah. yeah yeah <laughs> it was yeah, that yeah. was that yeah, was we are aware of the work. Yeah. that was thank you very much that yeah, was yeah, that, that was, was fun to see it, uh, to see it there but uh, but like from from a broader perspective so so this inclusion of uh, of a composite system although like professor bieminski birula mentioned in a uh, very much uh, non-perfect way so to say yes because using uh, uh, using non-relativistic uh, just like textbook uh, uh, quantum uh, quantum mechanics but still it, it it seems to have opened like a whole promising uh, promising field yeah with the with the internal degrees of freedom for example serving as clocks if there is some periodicity like, like, you, like you were mentioning so, so did I get it right that this is this uh, inclusion yes. of composite systems yes. that, that opened uh, several gates like to your uh, uh, to your research? Yeah? yeah, yeah, that is very true. And that was to some extent um, kind of forcing, uh, there, were con there were circumstances that forced my hand. <laughs> Mm. And um, there were three things. So there was uh, a visit of Danny Greenberger, um, who actually has, has his own theory that time has to be an own degree of freedom. Like really that there should be an operator and a cat. There should be a time cat. Mm. Um, and at the same time, essentially the same week, there was Harvey Brown, who is a philosopher of physics, who has this picture of um, all the relativistic effects rather than um, they wish that I guess he argues from the philosophical perspective, 
um, that it's not right to think that kind of time dilation forces particles to behave in certain way, but rather there is a dynamics that the particles have. And that's how we understand time because we look at systems and we understand time through systems. So that all time dilation and everything is just interactions mm. and not like some, you know, that things don't come from the space time, say having Minkowski signature, but things come from dynamics. And is it, from is that we extract- somehow in, in, in the same spirit of uh, Eric Barbour and his end of time, that actually there is no time. There is uh, just not really, no, I think it's, it's more really, um, I think his position is, is, uh, is already on uh, interpreting classical GR. Um, so that's, that's okay. quite different. So it's not proposed, it's, okay. it's really- um, It's not as radical a position, as Barbour position, Yeah, time, yeah, it's a position on the interpretation of classical GR. And then the third thing that forced my hand to look into that because uh, actually when I started my PhD was supposed to be on something completely different, but luckily <laughs> these things happened early on. Um, so the third thing, there was this paper by um, Holger Muller um, reinterpreting some of those COW phase shift experiments as time dilation experiments saying, oh, look, it's time dilation of the, of the Compton clock. And mm -hmm. we have a Compton frequency clock that ticks in every particle. But at the time I was already thinking of these theories by Danny Greenberger, that there is a time operator. And I thought, well, if there is some time operator, there should be some uncertainty principle and there should be some quantized mass energy, some, in, some uh, quantized dynamics that would have this time tick. And so I was kind of looking to, to see, you know, if there is any extra, like how to constrain some possibility of extra matter really that would force that every system has some uh, fundamental time degree of freedom. But then it all kind of fitted together because if you think of uh, this Compton clock, if you say, well, okay, there's really something that measures time, then there should be some, uh, some uncertainty. And this really leads to this correlation, this entanglement between the clock and the path. And so if there was really something measuring time at the Compton frequency in, uh, in this kind of matter wave experiments that Holger was talking about, then we would have seen that because this would reveal a humongous amount of which way information because they are very, very precise. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and so there, it kind of started to, to snowball really, okay, what else can we, like, how can we use those, sure, uh, it's, 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 this, this, this picture, the mental picture. So it was really, I mean, it's not like kind of suddenly we had the, an apple falling on the head and oh, here comes. Because yeah, I guess it's just not very obvious because I agree that from the point of view of looking at really quantum theory in curved space time, that is very, like I would, maybe let me say it's even more correct to look at some fundamental theory because you have everything under control. But we were sort of forced to look at arguments that we knew were incorrect. And we wanted to understand or give a simple reason why they are incorrect and how to describe them. And then it turned out, well, we make many experiments that test relativity, which are in this effective regime where we can apply this kind of effective dynamics that, that has many drawbacks, cannot capture everything. Uh, it even applies to spin where it shouldn't um, because the spin is not the scalar. <laughs> but at low energies, one can show from, uh, yeah, like Dirac equation for space and that, that, that the lowest order, the precession of the spin will have the right time dilation, even though it has other effects. It's not really, it's not really a scalar clock, but so it turns out that there is a well understood regime where this applies, um, and I think it has. Uh, it's very, it's it's very result. interesting the the inclusion of uh, internal Hamiltonian in the effective mass uh, mass operator. I, at least for me personally, this is this is quite uh, this is quite exciting. It's like you know. Uh, expression, uh, sort of quantum expression of uh, mass energy equivalence principle, like taking literally, and then, well, I, I, I touched on yeah, the one yeah, consequence, right. this this decoherence, uh, or, or it's more advanced form, uh, but 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 it leads to 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 to, to really some sort of exciting, uh, uh, exciting results. Uh, Magda, if I may, I have two questions. I uh, wanted yeah. to ask, uh, first of all, if I understood correctly, uh, the, the, the question is quantum, uh, is quantum gravity. We, we had here already a couple of seminars by, uh, by for example, Mauro Paternostro, who has been working on that. Mm, right. And Chiara Marletto, 
from Oxford. So uh, did I understand correctly that what the experiments show is discrepancy between this LOCC channel model, which is trying to reproduce uh, MGH, basically gravitational potential and the experiment. Could, could you please come back to that slide maybe? Yeah, yeah, that is, uh, that is correct. And so, uh, yeah, essentially, ah, uh, this one, yeah. Yeah, so the discrepancy is between an experiment where you have a superposition of the atom on Earth and this model. Now, um, some of the people, so I would say this doesn't say that detecting entanglement is not interesting. It's tremendously interesting to detect this entanglement. Like it's this toy model, it can go wrong on, on many levels, I guess. I mean, one can argue, well, you know, maybe it's unreasonably strict. Maybe it doesn't really generalize to continuous matter distribution. So maybe if one uh, massages it, there will be some free parameter and then one can only constrain some free parameter because the nice thing is that the model as such formulated in these original papers has no free parameters. So there is no wiggle room. It's once well, it's, tested, it's, it's far, tested. As far as far as I understand, so it, it says that actually testing for for this gravity induced entanglement does make sense, right? Because the model yeah yeah it says which, that it should be there. Which predicts yeah. <laughs> no no entanglement yeah. generation. Yeah. Or at least this particular model, it it fails. Yes. So that's the that's yeah. the state yeah, of yeah, affairs of with, yeah. with with this yeah. approach. Yeah. That this model yeah, this yeah, model yeah. fails. Uh, it, uh, to me personally, this does not answer the question that the gravity is, is quantum. It just says that the model is not uh, is not. Yep. That uh, is right. That is right. And there is not, yeah. not right. I can maybe highlight uh, one aspect where mm -hmm. things can change, because so here we uh, we took this model uh, um, at the phase value, and it really uh, inherently has that when the relative distance between the masses is in superposition, then there is decoherent. Uh, well, in fact, it tries to say something about entanglement. Of course, we, there is no entanglement between the position of the earth and the superposed atom. Like in the sense we, can, we are not measuring entanglement and saying, oh, the model is wrong because there is entanglement. There is no entanglement. <laughs> we are just saying that if the model fundamentally could not give entanglement, then the phase would be corrupted much earlier than maybe than we would is. have maybe mm -hmm. thought. But but um, so there is an assumption. I guess I, I should modify my bottom line and, and really thanks for drilling there. Uh, we, um, one can say that we make additional assumption uh, of linearity of quantum mechanics, like that it holds absolutely in the sense that, um, because this says that you don't have to go to, to test entanglement uh, where both position, positions of both systems are in superposition. Because linearity of quantum theory tells me that if I know what happens uh, in this case where Earth is fixed and the atom is in superposition, I know what happens when I add uh, uh, linearly amplitudes where Earth is in a different position and this atom is correspondingly some different position. Uh, and I don't need to test for that. In linear quantum mechanics, you don't need to test on top of, uh, like the, the linearity gives you once you know the answer to some question by linearity, you can extend it to two more questions, maybe let's say like this. Uh, but of course, many people believe that uh, applying superposition principle to very massive objects is exactly where quantum mechanics would have to be modified. Mm, breaks, and yeah, so yeah. let's say, so the main, because the, the point is the model uh, doesn't have any difference between those scenarios and perhaps one can then refine the model to include uh, that somehow necessarily you need to have um, entanglement generation to see the effects of this decoherence, while for the scenario like this where one body is fixed and it's just superposition of one particle but the other is fixed and therefore no entanglement that somehow maybe some, some uh, uh, revised model is possible that would not give such an effect. And so that, that's an open question. We haven't tried to produce something like this. So this says gravity cannot be a low CC channel uh, and the rest of what I wrote, um, assuming linearity of quantum mechanics, like on top of this. I guess that, that would be a, a, a generous 
from our perspective, but okay. I think that that's fair because many people do actually believe that that's not such a, a straightforward, uh, I say, position to say, well, linearity just holds. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, if I may, one, one more question concerning a, uh, uh, superpositions of uh, geometry. You had one slide uh, yeah. with uh, uh, exactly yeah. that one where, where, where the mass is in a superposed uh, state, a big mass is in superposed state as far as I understand, and this changes the, the local light cone, so this can change the, the, yeah. um, the casual order. And uh, you say that the, yeah, yeah. the, the violation yeah, yeah, yeah. of Bell's inequality is possible. Could you just give a hint what kind of uh, like Bell variables are there? Like what, what are the operators that, that build up the, the Bell inequality? And so here one builds um, an inequality where the local hidden variable um, is supposed to represent the time order of events. And you are constructing a scenario where you have two pairs of clocks um, and um, some target system or some, some, some kind of system. And on a specific like pre-agreed proper time of each of these clocks, there is some unitary that is made on this target system. And mm -hmm. then uh, you can uh, prepare, you prepare some final state. So depending what are the proper times of these clocks and what is relation between them, you will have certain operations applied first and certain applied second. Okay. And then you, okay, okay. you, then you produce certain state. And then essentially the theorem says that starting from a separable state, you cannot produce an entangled state if the temporal order is classical. And then uh, you can show that you can produce an entangled state uh, and formulate the full theorem that would, uh, that would take into account that you are doing unitaries on a system. And in the end, just measuring a standard Bell inequality on some other variables, uh, but the state, so essentially the main thing is the state you are preparing if it's entangled and allows you to violate um, some inequality, then uh, it means that the time ordering of applying certain operations um, is not fixed or probably is not a probabilistic mixture of some fixed orders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. anyone is familiar with the quantum combs um, or process matrix um, framework, uh, then this is an example of a quantum switch. Quantum, uh, okay, where, okay, where, okay, where okay, gravity, okay. yeah, okay, awesome. Okay, got <laughs> where it. gravity is essentially what, uh, what uh, or time dilation, what gives you the control. Okay, 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 got it. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, well, I think we kept you here for quite a long time. Um, is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? I don't see. Magda, this has been a pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, time and uh, and the exciting talk. Well, and all the best to the to the research. Well, thank you, and uh, the same to to everyone involved. And I... a long winter. <laughs> yes, yes, we hope for a long winter and some more of days of twenty three and twenty five degrees. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I included here my email if anyone wants to get in touch. Well, also you can ask uh, Jarek. Uh, well, my email is publicly available as well, so I'm not really need to do any, any extensive search. But if anyone is interested or has some more questions, I'll be happy to, to hear and, and get in touch. And hopefully someday it will be possible uh, to have some of you here. Um, I really hope to, to organize some some meeting. I even had funding, but uh, these things changed since things expired and we couldn't travel. And it's been yeah. Been yes. Quite Thank you very much for a very nice seminar. I was just saying, said as a cosmologist, classical cosmologist, nothing to do with the quantum. So really enjoyed yeah. it. Thanks. Mm, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, yeah. So I'll I'll let you move on to your to your day. And uh, yeah, again, thank uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Magda. Um, Thank for you for showing up, and and thanks, uh, Yarek, for for inviting me and, and this uh, tremendous Our pleasure, our our pleasure. Uh, let's stay in touch. I I might be contacting you from from time to time. Uh, Great. Let let let's stay let's stay in touch. 
Thanks again. Fantastic. All the best. Have a good night. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye. 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 Good night. Cheers. Cheers.